Thank you. Who here has been to Mongolia? Wow, well, we've got maybe a couple of hands. Then you'll forgive me if I have to paint a bit of a picture for you. You can imagine me and my best friend, aged 20, unbelievably dirty, filthy, head-to-toe filth, sitting on the edge of a dirt track in the middle of the steppe, looking out across the Altai Mountains as we tried to hitchhike from Ulaanbaatar in the middle of Mongolia to goodness knows where, in the middle of Kyrgyzstan. And we were sitting on the edge of this track, waiting to see if we could find another truck of people who were moving their incredible yurt tents from one end of Mongolia to the other to hitch a ride to try and get across the border. And this particular moment I'm thinking of, we were fighting because we had this much Mars bar left. And we needed it because all we had eaten for the last four months had been goat boiled in salty water, and goat's milk curded into a sour cream. So I think you'll agree the situation was pretty desperate. One of the reasons that I was incredibly keen to go to Mongolia was because that I was studying ancient history. And as part of studying ancient history, we studied Herodotus. And Herodotus had written about the peoples of the Altai Mountains, the backdrop to where we were, and how they had this incredible army of women women who were so brilliant at their jobs that some of them would cut their breasts off so that they could fire bows and arrows from horseback. Now, the flakiness of Herodotus' evidence was quite uh, remarkable. So a lot of people thought that he just made that up, kind of wishful thinking. But unbeknownst to me, although we were kind of following where these tribes had been, at exactly the same time, 1993, that we were sitting on the edge of this track fighting about Mars bars, an amazing woman called Natalia Polozhnik, I think I'm saying that right, apologies Natalia if I'm not, had discovered some graves that, were being fr that had been frozen in ice and therefore had this extraordinary treasure trove of amazing remains and artifacts right back to those nomadic people that Herodotus had written about. At the same time as her, another amazing professor called uh, Leonid Oblonsky from the University of Archaeology in Moscow had also found a huge number of graves for the people who roamed the steppe from the Ukraine into the middle of Mongolia. And what they found was incredible. These bones that they were digging up, with more and more incredible technology to look at the bone density and work out the actual shape and form of the people they belonged to, they realized were, to a quite considerable number, those of women. And these women had been buried, not with gems and with the traditional burial uh, accoutrement of ladies, but with tools and weapons, bows and arrows. So at exactly that moment that Heather and I were fighting over a Mars bar, as I had kind of romanticized about Herodotus's vision of women charging across the plains, they were discovering that that was actually true. Now, what the hell has this got to do with the internet? Well, I've been thinking about this a lot recently because I think we need to take some inspiration from these nomadic peoples and we need to create a new army of women, of warrior, warrior women, and we need to do it giving them the digital tools of today. Because I would argue that even though we don't have wars to fight in the same way as those nomadic peoples had wars to fight, we are facing some pretty profound and difficult challenges. Chronic disease, inequality, massive climate change. And the solutions to those problems will, to a large degree, be organized around the internet, around digital developments and solutions. And we need as many people as possible to be thinking about those answers. As Amanda Foreman said in her brilliant documentary on BBC Two recently, People think that one of the reasons that men and women were so balanced in these early communities was because, was because life was so precarious that they didn't have time to think about gender segregation. I think the same is true now. I think we here in the UK have an amazing opportunity. If we could just throw our imagination out there, 
to create the most gender balanced technology sector in the world. And I believe that by doing that, we'll be much richer at an individual level and at a national level. It wasn't always as profoundly upsetting and depressing as I find the sector now. Back in the early days of computing, as you probably know, a lot of the very early engineers and women using these early computation, people using these early computational machines were women. The first machine that people call a computer was actually built by the Lyons Tea Cake Factory. That is not why women were working on it. But the first computer, in quotation marks, that they discovered was called Leo, and it allowed them to measure the amount of cakes that they were creating in the factory. And it's widely regarded as one of the first computing machines. And the people that were trained to use it were all women. I was lucky enough to meet one, a woman called Mary Coombs. And she had an incredible and long history working in that early computing industry. She went from working on Leo in the Lane's Cake Factory in the 50s to then working on the first premium bond machine, Ernie, which was also populated a lot by women. And then for an absolutely remarkable woman called Dame Stephanie Shirley, who I'm sure many of you have heard of, who started a company in the late 1960s. She thought that she could kind of blow apart the models of working because of this amazing new technology. She wanted to employ only women working from home, building software. And she wanted to do it using uh, government contracts. So no kind of fluffy software development for her. She wanted the women in her workforce to be building the Polaris submarine, the black box for Concorde. Now, she's funny about getting her story, her company going, because she says that she wrote to pretty much every single department of government, telling them about this incredible workforce that she had up her sleeve of women at home. Nobody took her seriously until she started signing the letters with the name Stevie, her nickname, not Stephanie. And then, hey presto, she was in front of many ministers and started getting contracts. But what I find really inspiring about Stevie's story is that at one time she had 2,000 women all coding, all working from home on these really knotty, difficult problems. The black box for Concord, the Polaris submarine. Now, doesn't that blow apart quite a lot of stereotypes that we hear about now? Stevie's funny because she says that the thing that really screwed her company up was the Equal Pay Act and the Equalities Act, which was obviously brilliant for women in the round, but meant that she had to start employing men. <laughs> now, what I find really strange, baffling, and I have to say now depressing, is that that brave new world of the 50s and 60s, where women were really an equal part of this exciting and amazing technology revolution, has changed and become something quite different. Even me, as someone friendly described to me as the other day, a dot-com dinosaur, thought, age 25, in 1997, when we started lastminute.com, that this was going to be an incredible revolution, that part of the power and the excitement of the internet was that it was going to be a whole load of new voices, a whole load of different people, a democratizing force, something really that could perhaps put equality of all kinds at the heart of its new and rapid um, industrial rise. But that has not happened. Right now, the numbers that, as a percentage of women in the technology sector are smaller than the numbers of women in my other sometime place of work, the House of Lords and Parliament as a whole. And I find that very, very strange. Parliament, created through time, medieval times, arguably, and the technology sector, which has really only been around for the last 20 or 30 years. The numbers of women founding businesses are around 10%. Worse than that, the engineering teams, the power, as you all know, anybody that's been in a startup knows that people developing your software have it in the palm of their hands. Around 4% are women. In the venture capital community, again, I'm trying to get these numbers robustly uh, evidenced, but around Martha Lane Fox number, around 10%. I don't think that's okay, because to me, this is still one of the most exciting and powerful industries in the world. And we know that it's growing in importance to the economy. And more than that, we also know 
that products co-created by men and women are much more successful. Hello, Apple. Remember your health kit? You launched it and touted it about as managing every single bit of your effective health needs, everything you could want to measure, everything that you possibly need to know, except periods, the menopause, anything to do with babies. Could that be because there were no women on your design team? Arguably. And we know that companies that have a founding team with women in it, either two women and a man or a man and a woman, do better in profit terms. Everyone benefits. Sometimes I feel a bit like a parody that I have to even make this argument. It's such a waste. There are so many women out there and we should be employing them and employing their skills. How extraordinary if the UK, a small country with a small population, I was looking at this recently, and we actually have a population only marginally larger than Greater Tokyo, which is nearly reaching 50 million people. Surely we have the opportunity to say, you know what? We're going to be the most incredible place to be a woman in technology in the world. And that is going to create a kind of live testbed for other people and a place where we design absolutely rock and roll, awesome products and services because we are engaging half the workforce. And more than that, right now in this country, we need 600,000 IT digital sector jobs. 600,000 right now. And by 2020, people estimate that it will have gone up to 1 million. I think it will be significantly more. There are 800,000 women right now unemployed in this country. 800,000 and 600,000 women, jobs missing. Surely, with a bit more imagination, we could join up a bit more of the chain. Even if you think that only a fraction of those 800,000 unemployed women would like a role in the technology sector, it's got to be worth giving it a shot. There are loads and loads of fabulous things happening in this country. There are people like Sue Black running Tech Mums, teaching women in Tower Hamlets how to get digital skills and then they go on to be entrepreneurs. People like Emma Mulqueenie with Reword State and Young Reword State, helping young people get coding skills. And she has seen a big increase in the number of girls going into her program. People like Anne and Raphidian with STEMETs. People like uh, all of the Digital Mums coding teams. There are lots and lots of things happening. But what I would like to do is raise the ambition for the UK, say, you know what? We need all of the help we can get over the next 10 to 15 years, and this is something that we could put at the heart of our regeneration, and it will make us stronger at an individual level and at a macro level. We need those warriors of the future. We need people who are going to battle in all of the things that we face in challenges every day. The entrenched poverty in this country, through to the changes that we need to make in our education system, in our health system. Women have to be part of those battles. And if we don't empower them digitally, then I don't believe we're going to have as competitive an economy as we could. So I take my inspiration from those nomadic peoples, those amazing women, those people who recognize that in times of fragility, everybody needs to be part of helping for survival. And I'd like us to have a look at how I think archaeologists might find graves in the future. On the side, you see the, uh, I think that's a Scythian uh, skeleton from 600 BC, found exactly where I was talking about in the Altai Mountains. And have this, maybe right by Tobacco Dock, a woman, perhaps, with a USB port. Let's hope so, because I think we could do something incredible in the UK. And for my part, I want to make sure we scale up initiatives that are existing, we get more focus on it, increase the funding, and really make sure that we don't go backwards, that we go forwards, and that this incredible sector we're lucky to be part of includes everybody. Thank you. Brilliantly articulated, as ever. Um, Give us three things that the people in this room can now go back and do to try and build this new warrior class. First thing is, uh, Dot Everyone, the organization I'm starting to help make Britain brilliant in the networked age, is trying to gather evidence. Remarkably, there is not very robust data across all of the different bits of the chain. So if you have data, please send it to us. We're really easy to find. And I would also say that's a brilliant way of just highlighting how your own uh, organization is doing. So data is the first thing. 
Secondly, there are so many fabulous organizations that can encourage your workforce to learn these skills. If you have women that don't know about how to code, not just coding, but just more broadly in the digital space, then find one of the organizations and make sure everybody has those basic digital skills and then help move them up the chain. So that's the second thing. And then thirdly, I think it's about adding very uh, significant and um, interesting voices to the debate. So if you care about this, men and women, this is not just women, this has got to be everybody talking together. Please find me and help me because I really think we could do something remarkable in the UK. And we want to tell more stories in our magazine, so we oh, want yeah. these voices. Yeah. Martha Lane Fox. Thank you. Brilliant. <laughs>